I think it's pretty silly by now to pretend like the Marvel Cinematic Universe isn't a business-informed cash cow at this point. Dishing out two movies a year, advertising the next product at the end of each current one, you get the idea. For instance, let's face it, they can say anything they like, but the main reason Captain America and Iron Man are punching each other this time round as opposed to other people is because it'd be cool to see. Similarly, Black Panther's here because they want to get people excited for his movie in 2017, and Spider-Man's around for a couple of scenes because did you really think Sony were just going to hand over their most profitable character without Marvel throwing them a bone first by shoehorning him into one of their movies? But good films can come from anything, and someone, or a few someones, namely the Russo brothers and writers Stephen McFeely and Christopher Marcus, figured out one day that it actually is very much possible to put all that stuff in a movie, and have it still be involving, carefully thought out, and overall pretty damn awesome. Case in point, Captain America Civil War is pretty damn awesome. A thrilling, heart-pumping action blockbuster with the kind of underlying sophistication we don't often get within the genre to earn it a spot amongst some of Marvel's greats. Perfect? Not by a long shot, but with a tight script that aspires to integrate all its to-dos into a compelling character story, a touch of nuance, and an admirable attention to narrative and thematic detail, you can bet your ass it's good enough. The real trick of Captain America 3 is that the biggest threat these characters are facing this time round isn't a race of aliens, one pure evil bastard, or a Nazi-like regime, but themselves, both literally and figuratively. Not only does it use the back catalogue of movies before it to pit our heroes against each other in organic ways that totally make sense, it sees the characters wrestle with their own shortcomings and potential Achilles heels, and come out the other side changed for better or for worse. The conflict arises not in world-reshaping battles, but in the same breath that informed all of Marvel's characters' original inceptions way back when. Their own basic, fundamental, flawed humanity. Our story finds us deep within the aftermath of Age of Ultron, where after Cap and the Avengers stumble on a mission and inadvertently cause a considerable amount of property damage in Lagos, the government soon signs off on the Sokovia Accords, a new law to change the team from a private outfit to a United Nations controlled task force. And while some are against it, and some are all for it, namely Tony Stark, it turns out Cap just recently fell victim to people of power abusing the system and exploiting America's freedom in the name of national security, so naturally he's got his reservations but it turns out he doesn't have too much time to talk it out, as things become complicated when someone bombs the UN, and Bucky Barnes, aka the Winter Soldier, Cap's former war buddy turned brainwashed assassin, is deemed responsible. And armed with the impossible hero knows best foresight, Cap quickly goes rogue to help his once best friend, whom he's convinced is innocent, before the government acquires his location and kills him on sight. It turns out, however, that one of the casualties in the UN bombing was none other than King T'Chaka of Wakanda, and when his son T'Challa vows vengeance, he quickly suits up as the Black Panther, an ancient mantle passed down with each generation of Wakandan royalty, and goes after the Winter Soldier as well. And from there on out, it's a rush to get to the bottom of who framed Bucky and why, whilst also having to avoid Stark and company from taking them in by force. If you were one of those left disappointed by Age of Ultron's loud, overblown messiness, the Russo brothers would seem to feel the same. Civil War makes constant reference to just how self-defeating the idea of huge city-destroying finales can be at times when the goal is to save people, and while it feels like a very particular targeted riff on one film in particular, the movie makes no light of the fact that Marvel is still very much part of the problem at this point. Civil War agrees with the rest of us that things would seem to have gotten way out of hand with these explosive climaxes by now, and part of the plot this time round is motivated by all three Woodard showing up to tell Tony Stark that her son was one of the hundreds killed at the end of Avengers 2 and that she blames him for it, in turn motivating him to go government. That's another thing the movie really gets right, they finally made Tony Stark interesting again. Downey has always been perfect for this role, but he hasn't been nearly this captivating or involving since the first Iron Man. It kind of feels like he lost a huge part of his character in the films following the original, but the Russo's trick here is to call back to that more serious version of the character through the events of Age of Ultron, and it makes complete sense. He's marvellous in this. But this is indeed Captain America's movie, and while the needs of the character often finds Chris Evans tasked with making the least charismatic guy in the room interesting, he stays 100% committed to the role and finds a brilliant balance of trying to stay on a moral high ground with the loyalties of friendship. In terms of returning players, Sebastian Stan strikes a nice mix of sarcastic wit with subdued tragedy as Bucky Barnes, the dynamic between him and Falcon is really fun to see play out, and as much as I think that Hawkeye is an incredibly dull character in these films, you really cannot deny how much charm Jeremy Renner brings to the role. I was also genuinely surprised to see Wonder and Vision go through such well-realised arcs, especially given the film's already arduous task of spinning so many plates in the air at once. And in the way of fresh faces, the newcomers equip themselves admirably and are a ton of fun. 
Chadwick Boseman is Black Panther. Pursue this guy with any kind of underlying restraint and the accent, the suit, his whole character probably wouldn't have worked, but because the cast and crew have just completely committed to the absurdities of the character, the whole thing just works like gangbusters. You've also got to give props to the costume designers. I can imagine it must be really difficult making Black Panther work on screen without him just looking like Batman, but they've absolutely nailed it. It's one of the best comic to screen translations I've seen in a long time. Action wise, while I do think Winter Soldier offered up more variety in its set pieces, and I'll admit it's a shame so much shaky cam is used this extensively this time round when there's such great choreography and stunt work at play that you really ought to see, the film still offers some truly memorable thrilling sequences regardless, and nothing, and I mean nothing, can top the centerpiece battle. An extensive, unforgettable onslaught of hero versus hero, as Cap and Iron Man have their teams fully assembled, ready to battle it out in the middle of an airport. And it's not just because you get to see all those top trump who would win in a fight scenarios that you wish to see as a kid, though you do get just that, but because the Russos clearly demonstrate a tonal understanding of the Marvel world, in that as dark and serious as it wants to go, there is very much still a place of enjoyment to be found in a cinematic universe like this where anything is possible. And while some might argue that having a huge, sprawling, cosmic, splash page informed moment in the middle of the movie kind of interrupts the flow of what was otherwise a fairly serious conflict, yeah, but on the other hand, Spider-Man's here! Ant-Man's totally riding Hawkeye's arrow! Falcon and Winter Soldier teaming up! Black Panther versus Bucky! And then <coughs> Yeah, say what you will about the film going off the rails for a short while to give us Avengers fight each other the movie, it's an outstanding scene regardless, the kind you go to the movies to experience. And while everyone gets their moment, it's undoubtedly Ant-Man of all people that walks away as the most enjoyable character. He's absolutely hilarious, Paul Rudd nails the comedic value in having an average Joe fighting alongside these larger than life figures, and I'd argue the character works even better here than he did in his own movie, he's that good in this. And while it could have been really easy for Spider-Man's involvement to devolve into, come see my movie everyone, his presence would actually appear to be one of the movie's stronger subtle attributes. That attribute being that, as obvious as it may be that we're watching a studio arranged advertisement come to life on the big screen, you can indeed still take a business informed moment and make something sweet, natural and moving if you try. Now, does his being there technically change the plot much? Not really. Is his exit slightly awkward? I guess so. Would things be any different on the surface had he not been around? Probably not. But character-wise, his presence offers a huge insight into Tony's emotional psyche, and at the end of the day, he's just a joy to have around. Simply put, Spider-Man's inclusion here feels less like a one-scene cameo, and more like an intricately written sub-story that complements the narrative the movie's trying to tell here. For instance, while Tony's view may imply a bigger concern for the public's well-being, it becomes pretty apparent the further on we go that there's an underlying selfishness in his decisions. And while he may claim to take the moral high ground, it's very clear that his bigger concern is at the service of a guilt he can't shake off, whether he wants to admit that or not. Hey, remind you of anyone? It forces him into a really dark place towards the end and it works brilliantly. And if I'm addressing the whole is this the best Spider-Man yet question that's bound to be thrown in my direction, honestly, I can't say at this point it's not exactly fair to take two scenes and compare it to five feature films, but while I'm inclined to wait a little bit longer to see him in his own before reaching a conclusion in that regard, he's absolutely perfect for this universe and this film in particular. Tom Holland is a revelation, displaying all at once a character that's naive, endearing, believably awkward, and funny without ever becoming annoying. And as far as Spidey in costume goes, pff, I could not stop laughing and smiling, they've absolutely nailed it. I will say however that as much as I love the design, I'm not really a fan of the way the suit comes across on screen. I've heard from different sources that there were CG elements added onto it, but I did spend a majority of Spidey's screen time trying to figure out if he was even there while filming. The vibes I'm getting from that Homecoming logo are so shamelessly fun looking and, by all means, give them the spirit of a Saturday morning cartoon as much as you like, I think that's absolutely the perfect way to go. But since we're watching these characters come to life here, I'd argue it's really important that we believe Spider-Man is actually there standing with these guys, and I really didn't. But that's a minor nitpick. And while everyone will talk about his presence in the airport battle, which he is awesome in, my absolute favourite sequence in the entire film is the introduction to Peter Parker himself. It's incredibly well written, hitting every single beat we need to know about this version of the character naturally, and Holland and Downey sell the absolute hell out of it. 
That doesn't quite make the film impervious to the occasional flaw, however. For instance, while I like what they're going for with the villain Zemo, and his arc actually does bring the narrative full circle, his plan is one that specifically relies on particular emotional responses to situations I doubt anyone would be able to predict ahead of time, and it feels like an awful big effort to go to for such a small thing. But fortunately, the whole fight that hangs on it is so morally complex and engaging, you kind of just roll with it. For instance, in the very same climactic set piece, the focus very clearly shifts from the Sokovia Accords and quickly becomes about something else entirely, in essence, no longer being about civil war at all. But again, it's fueled by such an involving and emotionally driven character moment, you barely even notice it. And while at first I felt that there was a form of wrap-up missing in not having the same kind of thematically conclusive line from Captain America this time round, in the same spirit of Winter Soldier's The Price of Freedom is High speech, it quickly becomes apparent that it's entirely done on purpose. There's no clear-cut moral or message this time round, as much as there is one thematic idea that centres around the whole thing. When Woodard first appears to blame Stark for the death of her son, we're led to believe it's the push-off for the General Soviet Accords plot, a simple reason for why Tony hops aboard the government train, but as the villain's plan unravels, we soon realise the film is actually exploring a much more human notion. But as heroic as they may be on the outside, no one is invincible to vengeance. Civil War is not specifically about collateral damage, as much as it is about what losing someone to it does to a person. When they find out the ones they loved were simply wasted as a byproduct, an afterthought, a casualty of a war they had no fight in. And when we lose ourselves to that emotional response, can we still do the right thing? Can friendships endure? At the end of the day, I'm not certain if I can call Captain America Civil War the best Marvel movie ever, since the occasional noticeable cracks in the machinery leads me to conclude that Winter Soldier's cleaner focus just about puts it on top, but it's the best example of interconnected storytelling, taking years worth of movies before it, and exploiting that history of friendships and dynamics as a jumping off point for a story that takes these folks to new places, whilst effortlessly setting the seeds for others to come in organic, exciting ways, and somehow, at the end of the day, maintaining its narrative and thematic cohesion. That's an impressive feat that comes few and far between, and I highly recommend it. Cheers for watching guys, if you like what you see here, feel free to check out my video on who I think the villain in Spider-Man Homecoming should be, in which we discuss the treatment filmmakers have given to Spider-Man's gallery of enemies, and where I think the focus should really reside in the material. And as always, if you like this video, you can subscribe to my channel.